because I have not been divorced and I have no plans in the immediate or the fu far future of being divorced. It's not in my vocabulary. I've been married 30 years. I've never in 30 years suggested to my wife that we get a divorce. I've suggested murder, but I've never, I've never suggested divorce. <clears throat> and uh, I, I uh, well, you'll know tonight my thinking about the subject before the evening is over. Now, it's a very delicate subject, and uh, some people think it's the unpardonable sin. Most people do. They think it's the unpardonable sin. A strong society depends on strong families. Our society is in the, situate in the trouble it's in today because our homes are in serious trouble. God, the home is God's plan. It's the first institution that God ever started, the home. The reason the home is so important to society because it is in the home that values are taught and human relationships are learned. And if people can't get along in society, you won't have a society. You'll have a dictatorial state with a few people with guns ruling and the rest will be, uh, will be slaves of the state. That's what happens because if people can't get along, you have chaos. And if you have chaos, you wind up going to jail. You know why people go to jail, many of them? Because they can't not get along in society. You know why many folks can't get along in society? They didn't learn to get along at home. Boys and girls can't get along with their dads and moms, have a hard time getting along with husbands and wives. Relationships are learned in the home. So God's plan was that in the home, values would be taught and relationships would be established. That's why it's so important for boys and girls to get brothers and sisters to get along. It's very important. That's why it's important for children to respect their parents and parents to train and respect their children, to respect their rights and uh, to uh, have some courtesies and manners. All of these things should be taught in the home. Now, they definitely are not being taught in the home. If you don't believe it, go in a public classroom sometime or go down in our junior church and see many of our bus kids. Now, we thank God for the bus kids, but the truth is most of them are from uh, divorced homes, many of them just one parent in the, in the situation. You bus captains will know that to be true. So a strong society depends on, the, on a strong home, and when the homes go, society is in big, big trouble. As a matter of fact, you will have a police state. That's what will have to happen because the children will be supported by the state and uh, anything the state supports, it controls. And so uh, the home is God's plan. I have never, in my, to my knowledge, in 15 years that I've been pastoring at Open Door Baptist Church, I have never recommended anybody get a divorce. Never. You say, well, good, amen. I don't, you must not believe in divorce. I didn't say that. I said I've never recommended it. And I don't recommend it. So we'll get that right up front in case you're taking notes or buy my tape. That'll be right on the very front. I never recommended it. I've seen some times when I wanted to recommend it, I thought, man, if anybody will leave that old hussy, you ought to do it. But I never said it. I've seen times when I thought that, that woman is a fool to live one more night with him, but I didn't say it. I don't recommend it. All right. <clears throat> so most of the problems today in our society are the result of children coming from homes that are disrupted. Divorce solves very few problems. And I think that before anybody ever talks about divorce, that they ought to do everything under the sun to work out their problems. Divorce is, is many times just running from problems. You'll never find two people right with God who get a divorce. One will be out of the will of God, and both may be. But you'll never find two people in the will of God who get the divorce. And almost without exception, the person who initiates the, the divorce believes the other person's out of the will of God. That's, and sometimes that may be true. It's not always possible to maintain a relationship. It was not possible in the Old Testament. It was not possible in the New Testament. It's not possible today, not always possible today, and will not always be possible tomorrow. God, knowing this, made some provisions for his creatures. And so, First thing we need to look at as we think about it, it's better that you don't even get married. Did you know the Bible teaches that? As a matter of fact, if it is better for you, if you can, to stay single. It is better for you, if you can, to stay single. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll look at a few scripture tonight in the time we have together. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 
and verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. It is good and proper and best if you don't touch a woman. And uh, the, the, the idea here is not talking about, I know, I've said it, and I think there's truth in it, but I don't think that's what the text is teaching. Uh, the idea is not that women respond to touch and men respond to sight. I mean, I believe that, but that's not what this text is teaching. The idea here is better to stay single, better not to touch a woman. Marriage is physical. So he says in this text, verse 1 and 2, he said, it is best for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless, to avoid fornication. Let every one of you have his own wife, and let every wife have her own husband. Now, if a person can live without being overcome with sexual desires, then God says it is good. He said, I'm not commanding it, but he said it's good for that person to stay single. If you'll notice in verse 9, but if they cannot contend, let, or cont content, contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So it is better for a person to marry than it is to have difficulty with uncontrolled passions. A man or a woman is not supposed to satisfy their sexual desires by going downtown or finding a friend in the church and shacking up with them, or sneaking out occasionally and having an affair. All of those things are wrong. Now, God has made provision for folks who cannot maintain a life of separation from the opposite sex. Nothing wrong with marriage. The Bible said it's honorable in all, the bed undefiled, and so on. God instituted marriage. But when you get married, you will take on another set of problems. But it's better and right, it's good for a person to get married. It is not good for people who have sexual desires to satisfy those sexual desires by any immoral means. God has made a provision. That provision is marriage. No excuse in God's uh, word for a single person to be immoral. In verse 7, you'll notice, for I would not, for I would that all men were even as I myself. Now the apostle Paul was single. Paul didn't have a wife. And he said, I would that all men were like me. Now the reason for that, of course, primarily for the Christian, is a single person has no responsibility to a wife, has no responsibility to children. That's why the Catholic Church promotes celibacy of the priesthood, is so they do not have divided loyalties. They will be 100% loyal to the church. So a single person who can contain and does not burn can dedicate himself or herself to the Lord 100%. Now, you may be, as a married person, you may be dedicated to the Lord 100% too, but you can't give 100% of your time preaching the gospel and going soul winning and being, you've got a wife that, de that demands and deserves attention. You've got children that demand and deserve your attention. You have a lot of other responsibilities that fall within the will of God for you if you're married. But a single person has more time did you ever read where it says that a person that's married cares for the things of the world, how they may please their mate? That's not talking about worldly, being carnal. It just simply says that a man who's married cares for the things of the world, a new Alfa Romeo, so he can get it for his wife. Something of that nature. Now, you see, if he were single, he could have bought that for himself and gone soul winning in it. Nevertheless, that's the idea. So if you look at verse 7, he says, I would that all men were as myself, but every man hath his proper gift. Now, you might want to underline that word proper gift. Now, he is talking about celibacy, marriage, and burning. But right in the middle of it, he said, I would that all men were like me, but all men can't be like me. Why can't they? Because my ability to remain single and remain pure is a gift from God. If you took the Christian gift survey not long ago, you'll notice that one of the questions on there had to do with celibacy. Don't you remember? Of course you do. And celibacy is a gift. And so um, Paul said in verse 7, For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God. 
one after this manner and one after that. After what manner? Some to be married, some not to be married. Some to contain, some cannot contain. Neither one of those are right or wrong. There's no rightness or wrongness in either one of them. God intended, if everybody intended for everybody to have the gift of celibacy, that you wouldn't be here. Very simple, isn't it? God told them to reproduce and multiply and so on. So marriage and raising children and having a big family is right. The Bible says a man, uh, children are an heritage of the Lord. You can't have too many or the wrong children. Every child is a gift of God. All right, then if you'll notice again in verse 8, it is better for widows if they remain single, but it's not wrong if they get married. Verse 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. That unmarried there is widowers. The unmarried, it's the context, is unmarried men and women, widowers and widows. Nothing wrong for them to get married, but it's better if they stay single. Why is it better? It's always better for everybody to stay single. I'm not talking about right or wrong, I'm talking about better. So you understand then when it comes to this matter of being uh, married or unmarried, marriage solves the problem of adultery, but it does not solve a lot of problems. You, you create a lot of problems for yourself, but those go with it. You have problems when you're born. You come into this world, you're going to have problems. And so I don't think a person should be afraid of marriage, but I think a person ought to uh, consider the responsibilities that go with it and uh, realize that it is a covenant that you make with your husband and your wife and with God. Now, marriage is a physical matter. Marriage is a physical matter. And that's so important that it's overlooked by almost everyone. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Bible said it's better to marry than to burn. Marriage is a physical matter, and the opposite of burning would be the marriage. Marriage solves the burning. And so it is a physical matter, and you'll notice it is also a coming together, verse 7. It is a coming together of a man and a woman. For I would that all men were of myself, but some have this gift, some has his proper gift of God, one after this manner, one after another. So, marriage then is a coming together of a man and a woman. That is, marriage as it is constituted in the Bible. Over in Matthew chapter 19, if you'll turn there, this is the text everybody uh, gets hung up on. This one in Romans 7, we'll be looking at it in just a minute. But in Romans or in Matthew, Matthew 19, 5, Jesus is talking about marriage, but verse 5 tells you that marriage is a physical matter. And for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. Now, that word cleave is interesting. Sometimes it has to do with dividing, and sometimes it has to do with putting people together. You glue two things together, and they cleave together, and you take a meat cleaver, and you separate things. In this text, cleaving together is talking about physical union. It's not talking about the man going to another state and his wife going with him, hanging onto his shirt tail, or following later. That's not what the word cleave means. Cleave is where two things are put together physically. And if you'll notice, it, 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 we know that because it says, they too shall be one flesh. Now the one flesh is when the two people are joined together. And the mistake that people make is they think that a ceremony is what joins people together. A ceremony joins no one together. A ceremony joins no one together. Marriage, the word marriage means joining together of flesh with flesh. Not somebody pronouncing you husband and wife. You don't find that in the Garden of Eden. You think Adam went out and <clears throat> got a coconut shell and knock the hole through it so he can make a ring for her. Who do you think gave him away? God, I gave, give you, you take this man. There was no ceremony. They just came together, and when they did, they were married. That is, when they had sexual relationships. Haven't you heard of people say they consummate their wedding vows? 
What do you mean by that? So a ceremony is not what joins people together. You'll be hard pressed because they do not mean the same, just like the word marriage and husband do not mean the same thing. They're not even the same words. A person may be a husband without being married. Didn't you ever hear about a man who had a vineyard and he let it out to a husbandman? And a person can be married without them being your husband. A husband is a provider. That's what the word means, husbandman, caretaker of a vineyard. That's not what marriage means. And so it is a physical joining flesh with flesh. And so Jesus said to the Pharisees here in Matthew 19, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And it is the one flesh that God is interested in to make them complete. Did you know a woman is nothing more than a man with a little different equipment? That's it. She's a woman, and she is part of his flesh. God, didn't God take a part of man's flesh and make a woman? It's, almost, it's a paradox, really. He is a she. If you clone an individual, you have two men. But what God did is he took a part of a man, a part of a man, and made a wool man, or a man with a womb. And so marriage then is when two people are joined together physically. I'll show you that in just a moment. All right, if you'll notice again with me in Genesis chapter 2, you, you, he quotes it there, and I've quoted it before, but in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 23, Genesis 2, 23, Jesus is quoting this, Genesis 2, 23 and 24. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone. How could she be his bone? Because God took one of them out. And this, as he stood there and looked at it, it was actually his flesh. That was his flesh. And uh, he said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called wool man because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the one flesh is a physical matter, and the physical matter is the marriage. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians 5.31. <clears throat> Ephesians 5.31. The Apostle Paul talks about this. Ephesians 5.31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife. See that word joined? It doesn't mean holding hands. Now, if it is your intent to get married, please unite your right hands. That's not what it's talking about. Joined together doesn't mean the wedding vows that a priest or a preacher or an ordained clergyman or anyone else pronounces over people. And that is your mistake, and that is the most common thinking, that is the thinking of the common man, that a marriage ceremony is what makes a marriage. And that's the problem you've got. He says that they shall be joined, in verse 31, unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. So marriage is a man and a woman being joined together married together in a physical act. That is marriage. Again, in 1 Corinthians 16, in 1 Corinthians 6, 16. Now let me tell you why people reject this, those who, who may understand it, um, for this reason. Because a lot of Christians are not living for God. They are unfaithful. So they think because they've got a marriage license, they have one wife, 
or they're married to one person, but all the time they may be running around with someone else. And the truth is, when you do that, you are married to somebody else because the physical union is the marriage. So when a person, so if a person can believe it's a contract or a, or a piece of paper or a ceremony he goes through, why, he can be as unfaithful he wants to, but he says, I'm married and I got one wife. But that is not true. You didn't get that out of the scriptures. Let's go to chapter 6 here, and we'll notice chapter 6 and verse 16 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6, 16. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. A man who is joined to a harlot becomes one flesh. What is the one flesh? It's the marriage. It's not the ceremony. A fellow's not going to go down and have a ceremony with a harlot. You don't have to have one. Ceremony wouldn't make any difference. When you join to her, you're married to her. Uh-oh. That's what it says, isn't it? And that's the same thing that Paul said in Ephesians, chapter 5, just a moment ago. They shall be joined together, and they too shall become one flesh, and marriage is joining two people together. And no man on the face of the earth can join two people together. They join each other together, either under God legally or immorally, one way or the other. So you see, marriage is when flesh joins flesh. And thus Paul tells the Christian to flee fornication. Flee it. Run from it. In verse 18 of the text we just got through reading. Look at it, verse 18. Flee fornication. In 1 Corinthians 6. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sins against his own body. How does he sin against his own body? He temporarily breaks the marriage contract with his, where the marriage commitment with the other person because he's joined to somebody else now. Has nothing to do with the contract, folks. Now, if you'll know, <clears throat> you should know that the problem about divorce was a problem that the Pharisees kept bringing up. If you go to Matthew 19 with me again, you'll see that. They were classics at bringing up issues to put the Lord on the spot. And here in Matthew 19 and verse, uh, verse 3, 19, 3, the Pharisees also came to him, tempting him, and saying, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? You might want to underline that word, every cause, because that's the key. Every cause. Um, in Luke 16, let's go to Luke, keep your place in Matthew, let's go over to Luke 16. And it's interesting that in the midst of this chapter, our Lord makes a statement that is somewhat startling. But in Luke uh, chapter 16 and verse 14, and the Pharisees also who were covetous. Wonder why they were covetous. You know why they were covetous? because they wanted to appear moral on the outside, but they were lusting after the young women that came to the temple and envying the men who were taking them out behind the temple and having sex with them. But they had to maintain a, a respectable image, but in their heart they were covetous. Now the context is talking about the Pharisees being covetous, tempting the Lord Jesus Christ, and then it talks about this matter of adultery. Why did the Lord throw that right in there? Look at verse 15. He said to them, you, just, you are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since the time the kingdom of God is preached, every man press, um, uh, and every man presseth into it. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one jot, uh, one uh, jot of, tittle of the law to fail. Verse 18, whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marries her that is put away commits adultery. 
So Jesus, right in the middle of this confrontation with the Pharisees, talks to them about this illegal joining of flesh with flesh. Now, in Matthew chapter uh, 5, verse 28, I'll tell you why Jesus was talking that way. If you go to Matthew 5, 28, you'll see it. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman and lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. Now, that's what these Pharisees were doing. They were maintaining a respectability. They were saying, we've got a contract, a piece of paper, and we are married, but we are at liberty to think what we want to think. And in their heart, they were committing adultery. And so it's these Pharisees who had sexual hang-ups, who made the big issue about the sexual problem. And so they came to the Lord tempting him. Now, I want you to notice something in chapter 8, and I'll show you that these fellows have got a real problem. Go to Matthew chapter, uh, John chapter 8, please. You know the story about... Uh, the woman taken in adultery. <clears throat> it's the Pharisees again who are on the scene. Matthew, or, uh, John uh, chapter 8. And let's see. In uh, G verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning came to the temple, and the people sat down, and look at verse 3. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. Would somebody like to check that text and find the man for me? They said we caught her in the very act. I suspect there was a man around somewhere. I wonder where he's at. Now remember, these are the religious leaders, scribes and Pharisees. They've brought a woman, and they said, Moses said to stone her. What do you say? He said, go ahead, pick up a rock. Those of you that are without sin, throw the stone. Watch what their response was. It says in verse 6, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So that when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said, He that is without sin among you, cast the first stone at her. I wonder why he brought up stones. I'll show you in a minute. And look at verse 9. I wonder why these old boys got under conviction. And again he wrote down and wrote on the ground, and they, when they heard it, being convicted at their own conscience. Uh, we know what their problem was, don't we? Well, let's go back to Leviticus 20 and see what their problem was. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. Now remember, these are the religious leaders. And we've read on three occasions where these birds have come to the Lord Jesus about this issue. Look at Leviticus 20 and verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, now you want to underline that, another man's wife. Another man's wife. Even he that committeth adultery and with his neighbor's wife and the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. You see, these rascals brought the woman to have her put to death, but they didn't bring the man. And when Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground, I suspect he wrote Leviticus 20, verse 10. And they were convicted in their heart. Why? Because over there in the Gospel of Luke, where I read just a moment ago, that they were those that justified themselves before men, but God knew their heart. And in Matthew 5, Jesus said, He that looks upon a woman to lust after her, which you rascals are doing, you are just as guilty as the others. You covet them, but you've got a piece, you've got a piece of paper, and you think that that's what you've got to be loyal to, but you can think anything you want to. Won't work. And so they brought the woman. So marriage, in the beginning was a physical joining of people together. Now let's go back to Matthew 19 again. Matthew 19 and uh, verse uh, 4. Matthew 19, verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female? 
and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh, wherefore they are no more two, but one. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. How does God join people together? How does God join people together? Through a pastor that pronounces people husband and wife. I now pronounce you husband and wife joined in the holy bond of wedlock. That's not in the scriptures. Find it. It's not there. That's Catholic. You don't find it in the Bible. What God hath joined together. How does God join? Are unsaved people married? Does God join a saved person and an unsaved person? What if they get married? Did God join them together? You think God blessed that marriage? What if an unsaved man marries an unsaved woman? Did God join them? What God joined together? What if an unsaved man marries a... Uh, 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 I don't know how I said it the other way, but it's the other way. Uh, so suppose, uh, are they joined together? See, the Catholic Church teaches unless you get married in the Catholic Church, you're not married. Because the Catholic Church, because marriage is a sacrament in the Catholic Church. Thus, no one is married who has not been joined together by God. And the only way God can join people together is through an approved authority, such as a captain of a ship, or a uh, justice of peace, or a clergyman. And if you've not been married by one of those, then you are not legally married. So the Catholic Church says... You Protestants are not married. Why? Because they think marriage is a piece of paper and a ceremony. And if you haven't been through a ceremony in a Catholic church, you're not married. Now, Protestants believe the same thing. They believe exactly the same thing. They believe if you have not been through a ceremony, then you are not married because they think marriage is a ceremony. Find that in the Bible. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I know, I smell sawdust. <clears throat> now let's go to the next thing that you want to hear about, and that's divorce and remarriage. Again, in Matthew chapter 19 at verse 7, they said unto him, the Pharisees, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put, your, put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And so if you go back, and then I want you to look at Romans chapter 7. Keep that place. This is everybody's favorite. Romans chapter 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Do you know the law on marriage and divorce? Well, you're going to find it out in just a moment. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that, a, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if she is free from the law, so that, but if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, though, uh, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. All right. So if you will go with me back to uh, Deuteronomy 24, we'll see what the law says about this subject. He said, for I speak to them that know the law. So let's see what the law says. The Pharisees referred to it in chapter 24. Chapter 24, verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her. See that word married? What is marriage? Marriage is when two people are joined together flesh with flesh not by a piece of paper or a clergyman. It's not there. That's the laws of the land, 
and we ought to obey the laws of the land, but that is not what marriage is in the Bible. And it come to pass that, he, that she find, you want to underline no favor? That's what it says. And he find no favor, she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanliness in her. Some uncleanliness. Some people says, well, he married her and uh, found out that she wasn't a virgin and so uh, he can give her a divorce. No. That's not what that says. And that is not what it's teaching. It doesn't say if he marries her and find out she's not a virgin, he can put her away. Is that what it says? That's not what it says. Notice again, he says that he can write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of the house, she may go and be another man's wife. Is that what it says? I speak to them that know the law, he says in Romans chapter 7. So here's the law on the subject. And when she departs, she can be another man. Verse 3, and if the latter husband hate her, see that word hate? It's not spelt like adultery, nor fornication. The word is hate, isn't it? That is what it says. He says in Romans 7, I write to those, speak to those who know the law. What is the law? In the law, if a man was displeased with his wife for some reason, he could put her away. He could write a bill of divorcement, put it in her hand, and she could take that divorcement paper and go and marry somebody else. And if she did, she was not an adulteress. Matter of fact, she, should go, she could go marry the second husband, and he could leave her. It says, as a matter of fact, if the, verse 3, if her latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of the house, or the latter husband die, which took her to his wife, her former husband, which has sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin which the Lord thy God hath given thee. So there couldn't be wife swapping. But she could go out and legally be somebody else's, somebody else's wife. Now, in Jesus' day, there were two rivals, Jewish rabbis. They were rivals in this teaching. Now, go back to Matthew chapter 19, and I ask you to note that word for every cause. Because in our Lord's day, there were two rabbis who were probably authorities on this subject of divorce. And by the way, divorce was rampant in Jesus' day. There never has been a society that did not believe in divorce. Every society has made has made. Um, uh, I don't know what the word is. What? Provisions. Has made provisions for it. All right. So these two men, one was Heliel, H-I-L-L-E-L, -L -E -L, and the other one was Shammai, S-H-A-M-A-I. These men were both rabbis, and they were authorities in our Lord's day, and one of them taught that this word, every cause, meant every cause, just like in our modern society today incompatibility, mental cruelty. Uh, you, you just pick a word and it was every cause, whatever, you know. Matter of fact, it, our society is to that degree to where you can walk through any bookstore and buy your own book and plan your own divorce. Now that never was God's plan, but that is how some people, like our society, has taken it to mean. The other was Shammai, and he felt that it was more of uh, immorality and impurity on the part of the spouse, and if that is what happened, then uh, the person had a legal right to give his wife or to give her husband a divorce. Now, Jesus set the record straight in his day. He, re -institu he instituted something that was new. What he instituted here is new. It is not what the Old Testament law allowed. And uh, so when Jesus said, except it be for fornication, here it is, if you'll notice it. He said, uh, uh, let me find it here. Verse what? Verse 9. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, commits adultery. And so our Lord then has uh, set up a new precedent that was not 
written in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verses 1 through 4. Now the problem comes with Romans chapter 7. And uh, we'll take just a few minutes of Romans chapter 7 and hopefully we'll clear it up for you. Now in Romans chapter 7, There's somebody, the, the way this is interpreted and read by Catholics is that you have a woman here who has been divorced from her husband, a bill of divorcement, and then she goes out and she goes to a priest or a preacher and signs a new contract, and when she does that, she is an adulteress. But if you look carefully at this text, that's not what it says. As a matter of fact, if you'll just look at it real closely, you won't find divorce in it anywhere. It doesn't say divorce. Well, I guess it does too, but let's, I'll show it to you. Now, brethren, now you know, brethren, or know you not, for I speak to them that know the law. You know the law? Deuteronomy 24 on this subject. He says, uh, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which hath a husband is bound to the law of her husband so long as he lives, except, except, hey, you know what the exception is? Who knows? Deuteronomy chapter 24. You see, you take that as a blanket statement. Listen to me. You take that as a blanket statement. That's a general statement. Because Deuteronomy 24 just put an exception clause in it. Deuteronomy 24 says, if a man has married a wife and he finds some uncleanliness in her, let him write her a bill of divorcement and she can go out and be somebody else's wife. He says, I write to those of you that know the law. Now, if you know the law, you'll know that there's an exception clause to that statement that the law hath dominion over them as long as they live. You understand that? It's very clear. But you see, when you read it, you don't read the exception clause because you don't know the law. All right, let's go a step further. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives, unless he finds some uncleanliness in her, unless the second husband hates her. Isn't that what you read in Deuteronomy 24? Did you? Okay, good. Because I know this is hard to get past the windpipe. But if her husband be dead, he is loosed. That word loosed, if you check it out in the original Greek and Hebrew, it means divorced. It says divorced. Same word. That's what a divorce is. It's being loosed. You are loosed from your responsibility. Let him give her a bill of divorcement. He's, she's loosed from any responsibility to him. She can go marry somebody else. Isn't that what you read in Deuteronomy 24? So then, if while her husband liveth, hey, but you put divorce in there somewhere, but it's not in there. You don't find divorce in there. You just put it in there because you've got too much Catholic doctrine in you. It says, if her husband lives and she goes and is joined to another man, she is an adulteress. That is what it says, isn't it? Didn't we say that marriage was the joining of flesh? They two shall become one. And if while her husband lived, doesn't say anything about a divorce. You read it in there. It says if her husband is living and she goes and is joined to another man, then she is an adulteress.